the wheel is called the whole movement, according to David Bohm, and just love the term, love the idea, the movement of the whole, uh, combining what Bohm described as the implicate order, that's the unchanging source consciousness, and the explicative order, our manifestality. And the whole movement is this flow that weaves the two together, kind of like an infinity stray in a Mobius strip form that has both realities in it as it turns and brings implicate and explicate together. The implicate co the universe with information to form itself in physical presence. We, as humanity, now need to come together in a super organism of the same extent. Drop our walls. Drop our silos. Find the community path of wholeness. So, by doing our work in service to the whole, we become ever more enriched individuals. It really does work. Manuel Kunzelman is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Emmanuel is an entrepreneur, writer, philanthropist, and activist for social transformation. He has founded and or managed numerous exchange organizations in Spain, the USA, and the United Kingdom. He is also the co-founder and president of the Fundación por el Futuro in Madrid, Spain, and I probably slaughtered that because my Spanish is not that good, and a co-creator of the Global Purpose Movement and Purpose Earth. He is co-editor of the anthology Purpose Rising from 2017 and the Holo Movement Embracing Our Collective Purpose to Unite Humanity which was launched in 2003, and I've got that book right here. It's a wonderful read, super book. Um, the Holo Movement is the culmination of his life work, and I'm so glad that he has taken the time in this busy time uh, to meet with us. Um, welcome to the show, Emmanuel. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and looking forward to it today. Thanks very much. You're, you're most welcome. Well, I always um, hate doing the introductions and that because you really your life's work is a lot more than a couple lines and sentences that, are, that I can read out in, in a biography. Is there some things that you can tell us kind of about your life's work, especially through the whole movement that would give us a, a better understanding how you would like the world to see you and, and how you've come to this moment in time for all the work and things that you do. Yeah, I'd be very pleased to give a little background and how we got here today. There, um, I'm a person who felt a uh, purpose in life from a very early age, felt like I had a calling. I think we all have a calling. We don't always realize it or understand it. So nothing special there. I think I was blessed with uh, meeting a few good people, mentors, and guides along the way to help me find that calling. But uh, particularly one of my very first classes in in college, uh, one of my sociology fellows put a graph on the board of exponential change and showed how the the world was uh, running out of time with the growth of population, the growth of armaments, technology, and environmental deterioration. We showed an exponential curve, parabola, uh, increasing over time, and uh, the curve kind of shooting straight up in the, the quantities of these, uh, what I just mentioned here, uh, population, arms, all the rest. And he said, what this graph shows is, and we're talking 1970, 71 here, so half a century ago, 
And he said, yeah, so what he was talking about then was quite revolutionary. Certainly, many of the same ideas were soon to follow, but at that point in my life, I'd certainly never heard quite uh, that explanation of the difficult challenges that our life here on planet Earth faces. And he said, you know, this graph I've just showed you uh, literally demonstrates that we are running out of time. And the challenges are huge. This is a, a singular moment, really, uh, to deal with this. And I present this to you, young people. Uh, this is the challenge of your lifetime. And if you want to do something about it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, I would also say it's not going to be solved with standard linear thinking. He called it the poet graph at the time, kind of gave it a acronym. He said it's more like pure poetry. You're going to have to be artistic, right brain, inclined, intuitive, um, multidisciplined, interdisciplinary uh, connections, and help us find a way out of the difficulties we're in. I was very moved by that uh, lecture from, this was Dr. Jeffrey K. Haddon at Tulane University, so fairly well-known sociologist. And I, the result of that lecture, I did feel like I'd found my life's purpose. Uh, he challenged us to write a paper for the course at that time as to what we might try to do to solve the world's critical situation. And uh, as a young sociologist at the time, uh, I did my best to describe what I thought needed to be done. And I said, we need to work together. We're, we're too divisive, um, everybody going in different directions. And I designed for that paper uh, the image of a wheel and said that uh, what we needed is to create a hub for the wheel, an interconnected space where the spokes of the wheel could come together, be fortified, and turn properly. So I didn't know what to call it and how to describe it in depth, but at the time that was the best I could do. Uh, Professor Haddon liked the idea, and he said, okay, now you've got your life's work ahead of you. Figure out how this wheel is really going to work and how it's going to flow and make a difference. Um, so I was 18 years old at the time and uh, dedicated my life to, to figuring out how that wheel might flow forward, how I might be able to help that happen, what role I could play in service to the whole, uh, to make my life meaningful, but above all, to help find solutions to the challenges facing our society. So it's been a, a journey of a half century since then. Uh, it's gone through many vicissitudes over time. Uh, I've attempted in, in many, many ways and different to, to work on it, learning as I made mistakes or didn't quite find the right solution at the time. Uh, a big turning point for me was in 90, I had another mentor who asked me if I knew anything about quantum physics at the time. I said, well, not really. And so he gave me a whole pile of books, mandatory reading. And amongst those books was the Tao of Physics, the Dancing Wu Li Masters, and uh, a small but complicated volume by physicist David Bohm. And the book was Wholeness and the Implicate Order. And as I was reading David Bohm's book, which was published in 1980, this was four years later, and I was trying to get through his understanding of unbroken wholeness from a physicist's point of view. And he said at one point, although we were seemingly very distinct from the infinite quantum potential field that gives rise to the universe, and here we are sitting at our desks and our chairs, and we seem very physical and quite separate 
from any kind of uh, field consciousness that may have given rise to this. It's all one and the same, and it all comes from the same source. And what ties these two together is the hollow moon. And when I first saw that word and what it described, I said, that was a real aha moment for me. I said, aha, the, the wheel is called the whole movement, according to David Bohm, and just love the term, love the idea, the movement of the whole, uh, combining what Bohm described as the implicate order, that's the un unchanging source consciousness, and the explicate order, our manifest quality. And the whole movement is this flow that weaves the two together, kind of like an infinity stray, an Mobius strip form that has both realities in it as it turns and brings implicate and explicate together. The implicate co the universe with information to form itself in physical presence. And then it leads to this point in time where you and I kindly having this discussion and reflecting back on that and so that we too can follow the whole movement back to the implicate order, gain more information, um, find a, a higher view, higher frequency of our knowledge of reality and apply that to the world's problems of today. So it was really at that moment, uh, all those years ago, that I, I had a pretty clear idea of this. Now, I went through many man manifestations over the years, and um, at one point they called it the Global Purpose Movement because I didn't feel like uh, it was really ready time to, to disclose or launch the whole movement, but that was always in my mind, and that was the direction I was going. So there's some of the... Brief uh, background story of this, uh, but it's been a calling of mine, and uh, over time, just trying to prepare myself, learn as much as I could, find my place in humble service to the whole, and uh, develop the tools and qualities I might need to to implement such an idea. That's absolutely wonderful, and thank you for going into um, such detail because that's exactly what we wanted to know and to, to make those connections. I also uh, have David Bohm's book. Uh, I'm sure the one you have uh, looks much different, you know, the wholeness and the implicate order. And then you mentioned also uh, Sir Dr. Fritzel Capra, the Tao Physics, one of his biggest and first successful books. And I, I'm also a graduate of the Capra courses and, and um, the Systems Art. View of Life. Uh, a manual that he wrote and teaches the Capra courses as well. So I can really see, feel, and hear that um, centuries worth of connections of time span that uh, you've been on this journey to bring this whole movement about. And the way we met is because you are who you are, you you invited me to come to the Holo movement and Ibiza. It's the wave. It's a it's a gathering that we'll have there for approximately a week. And can you tell us a little bit more about what's going to happen at such a gathering and what's happened in the past iterations of such a gathering? And when you bring these groups of wonderful people together. How does that strengthen your work and not only in the movement and, and on this journey that you're in and in process, how does that all work and come together? Yeah, I'd be glad to talk a little bit. We have the Polo Movement of Waves in Ibiza 2024 uh, coming up on May 23rd to the 27th. Um, so this is a, an international conference that we are organizing, uh, but just a little background as to how we got to this year's Holo Movement wave. So uh, long about 2019, I decided it was really time to put the Holo Movement in motion. Uh, I began to talk to a number of my friends understanding the underlying principles on the Holo Movement and trying to give voice to it. I worked for a number of years with my good friend Terry Atten, 
who has unfortunately now passed away, but Terry was always looking for the concept of a movement of movements. He was very intrigued with, with the idea. We had lots of conversations. His executive director at the time, Mason Ewald, joined us and a number of other people. We kept expanding the circle and having questions about what the core principles of the Holo movement could be, how those might be expressed. Uh, these conversations led to a the publication of a white paper on the subject. Uh, that paper was originally published in Cosmos Journal in the fall of 2021. And then that paper helped us turn this into a book, which is an anthology that you mentioned, Holo Movement Embracing Our Collective Purpose to Unite Humanity. And so then my co-editor, Jill Robinson, and I set about to get the individuals. We designed the book and the chapters. They flow in octave waves. And, and then in the middle, there's a kind of able pause that Ken Wilbur wrote his questions and challenges to the whole movement. And then we have another octave wave to kind of answer Ken's questions. And so we, we put that book together, and there are over 50 uh, contributing authors in, in different ways. Um, and just very grateful to everyone who collaborated on the book. Um, so many good friends, Jude Kurvan, Irvin Laszlo, Dwayne Elgin, Lynn Twist, uh, Ken Wilbur, as I mentioned, and many, many more. So it was um, a really gratifying exercise to see so many people <clears throat> contribute and design uh, their ideas into the context of the whole movement. Uh, then we decided to have an initial conference uh, last year, 2023, uh, to launch both the publication of the book and the Holo Movement in its modern day context here. Again, uh, I'm certainly no founder of the Holo Movement. The Holo Movement always was, always will be, and David Bohm was the one who described it. So I'm just uh, borrowing some thoughts from David Bohm and the Cosmos and trying to put them in a useful at this point in time. Um, but we we launched the book March 23rd, 2023 uh, in Sedona, Arizona. Sedona is my U.S. residence, a uh, very special energetic place. And uh, we had a, a conference there. Uh, very grateful to the evolutionary leaders who helped sponsor the conference, and uh, we sold out uh, the space we had in a very sacred uh, space there in Sedona very quickly and launched the whole movement last year. And as we were doing so, then we decided, well, we should also figure out what's next so that we can tell people at the conference. Uh, my wife and I also have a a residence in Ibiza, Spain, on the island of Ibiza. And we have uh, lived and worked here part-time for over 30 years. A uh, long history of creating projects on the uh, island of Ibiza, environmental center, it's a spirit festival, a spiritual center, a Greenheart fair trade shop, Greenheart music, uh, a number of activities. So the island has been always a very special place for us uh, to manifest uh, part of our spiritual search and with the community here in Ibiza. So we decided uh, 2024, let's do round two of the Holo Movement in Ibiza. And uh, we decided then our initial co um, conference was igniting the Holo Movement, but we needed to have something now that it was united, now that it was flowing what might we call this? And really, the Holo Movement, from at least my understanding, is a wave. Um, the universe was conceived, well, physicists have often called it a Big Bang, but uh, a lot of others have said, well, it's neither big nor a bang, um, and maybe it was more like a great breath or outflowing of cosmic consciousness. Whatever it was, it was a vibration. Something moved, something shook. Uh, the cosmos began and it flowed outward as a wave. And 
over the years since before I, I've worked very diligently on creating my own version of the wave model, how this might flow, what are the turning points in the wave, what are the, the critical most to intervene in the process to change the flow of things in a positive direction. And so I said, let's call it the whole movement wave uh, and brand it as such. So we have coming up, as I mentioned, our our second uh, whole movement conference, the whole movement wave uh, here in Ibiza 2024. And very much looking forward to it. Too boy, that sounds so nice how, how you mentioned that. I, I do want to go back to how we started our conversation and how you what you mentioned and kind of how you've been on this journey and how it's all kind of build up in this wave and the journey is, has evolved. Um, you spoke about not only systems, you spoke about exponential, you spoke about quantum, you spoke about frequency and resonance, how those all tie in. Uh, like I said, I started originally as well with the Tau physics from Fitzhold, kind of how physicists and, and uh, physics and David Bohm and quantum and, and what he wrote. When you start out your book, there's this big section talking about what David Bohm made. Let me touch upon that a little bit. Um, is that really the main thing that we're trying to say David Bohm was right and what he came up with is, is how it's occurred and where this brings everything that's going with the whole movement together and that's what we're where we're moving towards that understanding and figuring out how this journey goes. How how can you try and help us understand more through the beginning of the book with David Bohm and how that's also led into the journey, what you're discovering more over time? Because we also know that it's kind of his thoughts on quantum were at the time very controversial or very disputed, but and he suffered greatly because of that. But now that in our journeys, we're realizing he was spot on and, and actually, you know, the, the front runner and everything, and it's fitting together so nicely. Our understanding's coming to a point where we really see how it's not this big bang, it's this wave, and how everything's fitting together. Yeah, I, I'd be very happy to speak on that a little bit. So let, let's address the the physics first, and then we'll we'll move more into the sociological interpretation of what the whole movement wave could be. But uh, yeah, David Bohm was a, a very gifted physicist and one that he studied at Berkeley and then got one of his first university teaching positions at Princeton uh, in 1950-51. And uh, at that time, Albert Einstein was also a professor of physics near the end of his, his life at Princeton. So David Bohm met Einstein, and Einstein was very impressed with David Bohm's knowledge at the time. Bohm wrote a, a textbook on quantum physics published in 1951, which to some degree is still in use today, which is a pretty incredible uh, notion that something as advancing technological as quantum physics that a textbook over the course of 70 years could remain in print and use. So uh, Bohm certainly got the principles and the details of quantum physics down quite well. But he proposed at that time his theory of quantum physics, which uh, was based on what he called and has been called throughout uh, in physics, hidden variables. And Bohm said, you know, they're just some of physics that we're going to have to accept that we can't fully understand. Um, it's too deep and beyond our capacity at this point in time, so we have to build these kind of hidden variables into the equations. And in order for that to hold true to the theory, uh, it was necessary that the concept of non-local reality be true. Non-local reality means that everything in the entire cosmos is instantaneously did. Um, 
So that's a very huge assumption. And Einstein just couldn't buy that. Um, you know, the idea and the way it was eventually proven is if you take two elementary particles, let's say two electrons, and you pair them together, you entangle them so that their properties are the same and they're spinning with the same rotation. And then um, in a in an accelerator, you know, like in the CERN laboratories, you can take these particles apart and put a distance uh, between them of many, many light years. And then in the lab, you can adjust the property or the spin of one of these electrons. And when you do so, the one that was paired with it, no matter how far away it is, it will instantaneously do the exact same thing. So once these two have been paired, no matter how far you separate them, there is instantaneous communication. And Bohm's theory required that this this kind of non-local communication had to exist to make his formula for quantum physics valid. And Einstein uh, just couldn't accept that. He called it spooky action at a distance. And so, you know, Einstein and, and Bohm somewhat went their separate ways, and the rest of the physics community had a great deal of difficulty accepting this as well. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was very much on the radar these days after the film came out of, of him, and he was one of the most respected physicists at the time. And so the community of standard thinking physicists went to Oppenheimer and said, you're a great mathematician. Uh, can you disprove Bohm's theory here? Because this is pretty wild and crazy, this non-local communication. And Oppenheimer worked on it, and he finally came back to his friends and said, I can't disprove it. We, so we can't disprove it. The only thing we can do is ignore David Bohm. And so he was ignored. He was kind of ostracized from the physics community for being a little too unconventional at the time uh, for the standard Copenhagen theories have been interpretational quantum physics and others. But fortunately, some physicists believed in this. John Bell was one of them, and he took it upon himself. He he thought it was probably wrong too, but he went to a great deal of experimentation to prove or disprove it, and he eventually developed what has become known as Bell's Theorem, 1964. That was published. And Bell said, try as I might, I can't disprove this. Uh, Non-locality works. And, uh, you know, I read about that, as you mentioned, Mark, in Fritjof Capra's first book, uh, The Tao of Physics, and in The Dancing Wooly Masters by Gary Zukov and others. And this thought of this instant interconnectivity of beyond space and time. And that was a real problem Einstein has, is because his relativity theory clearly states that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. That's why he called this spooky action at a distance. How can something instantaneously uh, 20,000 light years away happen when there's this particle change? I mean, you know, you can't travel faster than the speed of light to do that. Well, evidently, the universe can and does. And John Bell proved that. And then it was subjected to progressively more rigorous scientific experiments. And then finally, in two, uh, the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded to, to three uh, who had dedicated their lives, Alan Aspey, uh, John Clauser, uh, Antoine Ziegler, um, who had all spent, you know, decades working on this and uh, had proven as well that non-locality is in fact part of the universe and works. And finally, the physics community in 2022 gave these two physicists the Nobel Prize uh, in physics for a non-locality uh, as 
for reality and the truth. So it took physics uh, 70 years to come around to uh, overcoming the opposition of Einstein and Oppenheimer and others and said, you know what? Bohm was right all along. This works. It is a valid theory. And, of course, that was right, uh, just so happened the year we were working on the anthology for the Holo moment. And I was kind of like, thank you, universe. Better late than never, you know. <laughs> this is kind of a gift from above here. Great time to publish this book. Um, I just, you know, I'm not a physicist, so I couldn't interpret to any of the formulas or equations, but on a gut level of intuitive understanding, I just felt this has to be true. It has, you know, the universe, no matter how large, no matter how many multiple parallel universes and multiverses there might be, there's no limit to the size, but no matter how big it is, it's one. It is unbounded totality of oneness. It just has to be. And that was why one of the reasons I was always so inspired by Paul. And uh, seeing this come full circle with the Nobel Prize in 2022 was why it really gave us uh, a boost of momentum and energy uh, in the final stretches of publishing the book and the foreword uh, written by Will Keepen, uh is a physicist and great spiritual thinker and knew David Bohm, and he explains in great detail to to get us into the book. Um, but this is, um, I don't know, I mean, when I think of this notion of non-locality, that our thoughts right here energetically are connecting to all reaches of the universe in some way, uh, it's the most extraordinary thing that I can can imagine. I get excited, <laughs> terribly excited about these things. So that's a little brief history about that component of, of the physics. And uh, what's more, Bone said that the wave that's created by this initial vibration, he called it an ontological pilot wave. So ontological in the sense that it has meaning. And this is one of the first things that I set out to do way back in the 1970s of dissolving the divisiveness is at that time and still now one of the great divisions of our world is between science and spirituality. It seems like there are two different ways of trying to understand reality. Science, from a very materialistic viewpoint, evolutionary theory based on, you know, a selective model of genes over time, but it's all totally based on random materials. And Bohm's ontological theory said, no, it's got meaning. There is a degree of determinism in this. And of course, determinism is hard for the scientific materialist community to accept because determinism means there was some issue. Call it what you will. Uh, maybe we can just settle on some kind of divine source of consciousness. Uh, we're not going to go into any religious or spiritual terms here. Don't want to offend anybody in the materialistic community, but there was some kind of source consciousness that burst forward and code the whole process of evolution, an ontology of being that arose. And Bohm called this an ontological pilot wave, and almost pilot in the way the, the pilot flame of the water heater works. The spark was ignited, it burns, it flows, it keeps on going. And uh, the work I've done with my own rudimentary wave model tries to carry this flow of meaning. Omo is also careful to say, though, you know, it doesn't mean that everything is predetermined. It just means that there's an information flow that's allowing the universe to develop and giving it some parameters. But at the same time, there is most definitely free will. 
So it's up to us. You know, can we take the information we're getting from source consciousness and use that in our social functions? Or maybe we ignore it and let random chance take its course. So it's the two working together. The divine source information with our free will. And how do we combine the two and create a formula that works for the meaning of the universe? But to, for me, this was terribly exciting. I said, this is where science and spirituality meet. It's scientific. It's quantum physics. It comes from the infinite field of potentiality. Yet, you know, it's, it's real. And uh, it's spiritual at the same time. So it's, a, it's an incredible of, of the two that, that flows together. And then finally, just to add on to this, Baum, at the end of his life, engaged in a, lo a lengthy series of con conversations with Krishnamurti about his uh, He also became a close friend of the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama called Baum his scientific guru. Um, so Baum was very intrigued in the spiritual mode of his work as a physicist and towards the end of his life moved more and more in that direction. And he even touched on the sociological impulse of such a theory that might catch on and work in society. He developed, uh, he wrote books on creativity and on dialogue, Bohemian dialogue today. There are groups all over the world. Um, learning to listen to each other with respect and honor to find that center point of our differences. Um, so, you know, Bohm passed away in, uh, in the 1990s, but I feel it respects his work to use the term holo movement, and in this case, to apply it more in a sociological context and saying this applied to the uh, finding the hub of this wheel in a sociological context, the meeting point. Um, it's totally respectful to Baum's word. I think he would have approved of it, and in some ways uh, takes this theory of physics and gives us uh, a framework in which we can understand a way forward in these devices. So beautiful, thank you. Is there anyone besides you and and um, in the in the, the explanations in the whole movement book about uh, David Bohm and, and his work? Is there anyone else who's kind of picked up the baton and is continuing his work or, or seeing that the, the placement of all that he did and brought to the world is uh kind of pushed forward even more as, as far as understanding and, and uh, brought to the light more of kind of uh, running out the experiments and, and proving it to, you know, be 100% correct besides those three that you mentioned. Is there others still working on this besides you as well in the social arena? Well, in the social arena, I think there are all kinds of us working on this now. I think your work, Mark, is emblematic of this and, and so many people of trying to find a solution that will answer the many different diverse aspects seeking this uniformity. It, it's, not, uh, it's not that we all have to be the same. It's, you know, it's unity within diversity. But finding a way, a common meeting ground, the spoke of the wheel, as you, if you will, uh, of how we can work together. And then rather than living in a competitive city, competition and an idea of limited resources and scarcity, by eliminating all that conflict and finding collaboration for it, uh, we just instantaneously there find so many more resources at our disposal through the sharing of knowledge. Uh, and this is the solution-oriented way forward. Uh, so there are physicists, sociologists uh, all over the planet right now that are definitely on track here 
with this and it's growing day by day. So that's one of the reasons that gives us all, um, you know, encouragement here to say the whole movement has arise, has arisen and is here now because it's a worldwide movement. Maybe it hasn't always gone under that name. Um, you know, you can call it by a lot of different names, uh, but it is this movement towards understanding the unbroken wholeness as the nature of reality and that we poor humans struggling through our evolutionary uh, survival stuff here on planet Earth are just one tiny bit of the vast whole of understanding the cosmos. And we're ready for an evolutionary leap ourselves. We're, we're ready to Absolutely. break out of that, you know, cocoon of homo sapiens and move into a more holistic understanding of what our place in the universe is and what our future will bring. And so uh, you, Mark, and so many people doing good service symbiose. like you. Yeah, go ahead. Homo symbiose. Yeah, there's a lot of names. Uh, you know, I just recently wrote a blog. I said, let's not only change the uh, the species name, how about if we change the genus too? So exactly. I proposed Holo Universalis as the that. new idea, kind of in jest. But uh, yeah, seriously, you know, it's it's time to take a step above and beyond our hominid past here. Um, sure, we came from somewhat thinking stumbling apes but but now we're spiritual beings having a human experience and we need to understand that and implement it and accept that good gosh if we don't do it artificial intelligence will do it for us so come on humanity let's get together find ourselves as a new species maybe a new genus Call it what you will, but it's uh, coming together, this understanding of wholeness and finding ways to cooperate together to solve the problems we're facing. I used to have a company that was called Homo Universalis, uh, Academia Homo Universalis, and um, I, I totally uh, agree with this new wording. There's a great book from Glenn Albrecht. It's called Earth Emotions. It's about we need new words for a new world, new grammar, new words, new terminology to get us out of this anthropocentric way of thinking how bad humanity has been on, on the world and, and the environment into something that kind of embraces a vision of new words and terminology of where we want to go and where we, we dream. The reason I asked the question... Um, so I'm I'm perfectly in alignment okay. with the new wording, and we need to redefine the the homo genus. Um, the reason I ask that question is because you you mentioned cooperation, collaboration, collectiveness, this this growing consciousness. And what I find is uh, we're we're coming together, we're collaborating, cooperating more. But I want to know: are are the physicists, are the scientists, are the spiritual, are they coming to the whole movement? Are are people really coming together? Or are we still in that, uh, this is my theory, this is my work, this is my possible Nobel laureate chance, this is my thing, and we're still doing the siloed approach on, on our ways? Or are we saying the way, uh, this oneness, this wholeness, is is exactly that? How do we break down those 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 inner and, and physiological and emotional and spiritual boundaries and borders that we've built up come together in that collaboration and say, you know, it's not just uh, Fritzl Capra's theories or discussions or, or the cow physics, it's not just David Bohm, it's not just Einstein, it's not just um, Irvin Laszlo or, or um, whoever it is, it's all of us coming together to make all of those models work at once. You mentioned, you know, the work that I'm doing is what does a world that works for everyone look like, you know, type of thing. How do we get that symbiosis of cooperation, collaboration, oneness, wholeness? And I'm still struggling because there's such great leaders and uh, scientists and spiritual people, but it's still like they're not willing to come together to drop those boundaries to just 
blend or merge together in some kind of a bigger movement and togetherness. Well, yeah, you've really nailed it there, Mark. That is the verbial $64 question, isn't it? Is how we break down these silos and truly work together. Um, question I've been thinking about for a half a century and um, through different uh, incarnations of this, have learned a, a little bit along the way. I guess that one of the main things here is that this proposal for the Holo movement is as a movement of movements. So the Holo movement is not an entity. Uh, it's not an organization. It's not a non um, There's no board of directors. Uh, it doesn't exist in our conceptual terms of training. So from the beginning, it is launched as a movement for everyone who wants to be involved. So that in and of itself is is quite different. And then to hold the primary functions to get the movement going, of course, uh, one does need organizations working in different components. So these are the spokes of the wheel. And uh, we are looking for partnering organizations to become the spokes um, and to carry out the functions required. How do you organize a conference? Who does the promotion? Who, you know, handles the money? Who uh, hires the speakers? All the, all the rest. So we, you know, are working on that now and have a beautifully merged brain of collaborative organizations. And uh, the whole movement logo, which is for circ interlacing, is meant to demonstrate uh, how this collaboration can work in that as you overlap, you share space with your neighbors and you all overlap in the center in the spoke, and yet you all maintain a part of your original circle that is autonomous. And so what we try to say to everyone is don't worry, you're not going to be absorbed in the whole. You are already part of the whole. And by doing this is all that will happen is you'll gain and information and resources to develop what you're already doing, retain your identity and your autonomy, but yet it simultaneously be part of the whole. I mean, it's a it's a cool concept because we've had thousands of years of um, you know cultural conditioning and social socialization processes that say, hey, we're all in a fight for survival. You're not going to share your our secrets. Uh, this is competition here, you know, and uh, that is so deeply ingrained in our DNA and our neural patterns. Uh, that to break out of it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, but we're getting there. And I think one of the beautiful parts of the whole movement and this conference that we're uh, organizing next week is it's an experiment that of bringing everyone into the center and saying, okay, take off your individual hat for a few days. Let's find the cux of ideas. Let's work together. Uh, let's drop out the egos, drop out personal siloed interests and find the sweet spot at the core of collaboration and let's see if some magic can happen there or we can find a way forward working together and you know it's we've said as well that uh you know even as an individual when we think about well you know someday we're going to transition uh we're going to die right what happens then Certainly, our consciousness lives on. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but what does it do? Does it merge in the cosmic soup and just become one tiny drop in the ocean of consciousness uh, never to be understood before? Or does that drop of our consciousness contribute something to the whole? And in the process of doing that, the more we dedicate our work to service of the whole, Paradoxically, the more unique our individual qualities become, because that is where the true human nature arises when we see our purpose as serving the whole. And God, 
be, makes the individual all that more worthwhile. So it seems like, you know, it runs against historical perspective in many ways. But the more we explore and the more we work with it, the more real that becomes is that, hey, if I give to others and there's this whole ring of friends doing the same and I receive from all of them, I'm getting much more back than what I put in. So it really does work. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do, and that's why we bring people together in the whole movement way uh, to explore this incredible confluence uh, of ideas in the center. It's not only a growth of consciousness, it's that uh, growth of collective intelligence. You know, it may be a drop into that cosmic wave and I think it's a it's a big ripple effect, an exponential ripple effect of how that collective cumulative collective intelligence grows throughout the universe and can contribute to intergenerational or intergenerational uh, dimensions uh, of uh, future uh, life in the universe to really change the whole script there you know we've we've had so many familiar terms i've done this podcast and written books and done been in this area for about 32 years not uh as long as you have or even done the amazing work that you have but in this there's you know there's symbiosis there's uh, um epigenetics there's consciousness there's quantum there's frequency there's exponential there's resonance there's um, quantum mechanics, there's all these things that come up time and time again. And the cosmos, uh, uh, you, you've mentioned a few times, Carl Sagan, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, and, and others talking about that. But Carl Sagan said, you know, there's this growing consciousness that sees the earth as a single organism, and an organism divided amongst itself is doomed. And I I love I love that because I think it's absolutely so true. And he he spoke about that in his uh, his uh, Cosmos series that he did on TV. But there's this new understanding that's come to to the light in in the last few decades that is kind of an evolution of Lynn Margulis's work in symbiosis, and it's and it says. And ecolomenon, that symbiosis is the fastest form of human evolutionary innovation that we've ever seen. And there's kind of a sub-level to that as well that goes even beyond and ties to this consciousness, this oneness in the universe. And that is in all living systems, you and I are living systems in ecology and environment, all living systems, one plus one, Never, ever, ever, ever will equal two. It's a super exponential, but it's actually what we, you and I call, I hope, quantum tunneling. It's quantum mechanics. It's quantum tunneling. It's a, it's a, it's an unfathomable quantum number that uh, even I don't understand. I don't even claim to understand. I'm not a, a scientist or super smart guy. I'm just a, a farmer and and someone who's been doing this work a long time, trying to do the best I can. But I, I, I love that, that when we follow the laws of the universe, when we follow the laws of nature, when we follow living systems and have that collaborating cooperation, that's, the, that's that one plus one in living systems. It never equals two. It's all, always super abundant in this quantum. And so there's so many things with that that are uh, raising the frequency, raising this collective consciousness, raising the collective intelligence. And then you mentioned frequency. So I do have a project that's called ResonanceProject.Earth where you, you, uh, and we're using a universal frequency, the humming. In German, they call it Wummel. It's just the humming. When you and I talk and I agree with something he says, mm -hmm. If I eat a great ice cream or a great cake or something, then then I like hmm, you know. If I disagree yes, with somebody or I'm not sure what's in the hmm, you know, and it's the same hum at a different frequency with different meanings, but it's a universal language and frequency. Uh, I I believe strongly in, and I believe it's tied to not only quantum, it's not only tied to the exponential, it's not only tied to life. But it's, it's so vital, and we've touched upon all of those things. 
I see the cooperation, the collaboration, the oneness, and the connection of all those things. But it seems like just in the past decades, it's we're really coming to the understanding more and more of how real that is and how true it is and the power behind it. You know, I, I've been to the hospital. She's probably been to it as well. And when we go to the hospital, they go in an MRI machine. What is that? That's a magnetic resonance imager. They take the resonance frequency of your atoms in your body to see how you're doing uh, uh, through frequency and, and get that into an image. Um, there, for somebody to, a lot of the circles that I've seen over the years are like, oh, people meditating or humming or thinking frequency. That's woo woo. That's focus, focus. It's esoteric. Well, I tend to disagree. I think it's very scientific. I think it's very much how life works and functions. Um, but we've we've gotten into this mode of wow, that's woo hoo, hocus pocus. The chirping of birds in the morning opens the stoma on plants so they can do photosynthesis and thrive and grow and flourish. Frequency, sound, life is just an amazing thing that we're still grasping. But I just, all those things you said, I just see this wave, this hollow movement that uh, is is right into alignment for my non-school uh, academic learning that I'm now getting through your book, through through the, the wisdoms that you've shared, that are just putting my eyes to what the potential we have as quantum human beings to really kind of ride the wave into a new epoch, a new uh, a new era for humanity that's intergenerational, well beyond and. And so I, I, I know that wasn't the best formula question at all, kind of tying some things together, but I believe there are some strong questions to the things you brought up right in the beginning in terms that you used. I, I would like to see, do you feel the same way? Do you have any more clarification that maybe I'm not seeing in, the, in a way that can help us all understand what a great opportunity we have to, to kind of join this movement of movements? Yeah, well, thank you for that. And that was very eloquent, Mark, and you really tied these concepts together nicely yourself. Um, the hum is the primordial ohm. It's the first initial vibration that gave rise to all this. That is the base cosmics. That is the sound of us coming together on a common frequency. And as a wave, then if we're on a common frequency, we become waves in phase. And so when we're in phase, the waves multiply and become like this, and they move in phase. Right now, of course, it's very chaotic, and so all the waves are choppy and nothing's really flowing. So we can just add, you know, the power of a wave, a surfer out at sea, uh, has a much smoother surface to glide on than little kids playing in a public swimming pool where it's all random chaos. And if we can catch that wave together with the right timing, the right space, which is now, you know, and that is the thing, the resonance, the frequency, it all comes down to we are in a singularity like there has never been in the history of the universe. You know, indigenous relations have often said there have been three great miracles to understanding of the universe. The beginning, the initial vibration, whatever we call it, and from an earthly presence, the, the rise of life on earth at the turn of a wave, and then the dawn of human consciousness. Three great miraculous things. Where did they come from? You know, random selection didn't produce life in human consciousness. Well, now we're at a trough of a wave, and we really need nothing less than the fourth great miracle of the history of the universe to turn this around, to make it a leap into a new species. And it's a collective leap. But not only is it not woo-woo, it's the greatest idea whose time has ever come. It, it really is 
who doesn't really in their heart and soul want to come together, find solutions and work together instead of fighting, competing, all the rest that we burdened ourselves with through human history. Ah, this is the moment. It's a singularity. You can't fit it into this tiny little space and time. It's so important. It's so dynamic, yet it's so real. And there have been singularities in the past. This is the one. And we just say anyone born in this space and time, in this moment of history, is blessed to be here. And we all have this incredible serious. Let's get this solved. And what draws us there is what is called a holotropic attractor. In case there is always an attractor, there's some kind of meaning, there's an exit door of order out of the chaos through activity, and the attractor pulls us through. And here it's a holotropic attractor, holo meaning drawing us, bringing us a tendency to wholeness and oneness. That's our destiny. That's our birthright. That's where we're headed. That's the resonance, the frequency that we're all following in phase together to make happen here and now in this point in history. I go on for hours. It almost feels like the, the high point of, of our, our conversation. I do have a, a few more questions before we wrap up, and I just want to make sure that we discuss everything uh, before we do. I have some that I'm, I'm sure you've asked yourself over time in, in, in your research and, and that a lot of it is what what in the business world or over the years from Napoleon Hill and others is kind of what what's your why? What's your purpose for existing? Um, I think it's important in a lot of aspects because if people don't have their why, they don't understand their purpose for existing it's hard for them to know why they're here where they're going what they're doing how to collaborate and cooperate and the people we've discussed so far on this this podcast are all people who have had who found this life's mission this purpose this thing uh that has then guided their work and their actions till their death for most of them and i i see that and a lot of places in our world that's really lacking and so um uh people don't know their why they don't know what a world that works for everyone looks like but they don't even know their own why and purpose because of the systems that have been created before so my question for you is first and foremost what's your why what's your purpose for existing well i think the the grand why really for all of us at some point in time, some incarnation or other, is how can we be of service to the whole in the most effective way possible? So that means finding the natural talents we have. I mean, some of us are wonderful singers, so you can get on stage and inspire people through your song. I can't carry a tune, so unfortunately, uh, I wasn't destined to be a rock star. But, uh, you know, so we figure out uh, what our qualities are and what we can best utilize to be of service to the whole. And, and if it's, it's our talents, then we're going to enjoy the process too because we're doing something we're good at. But the the motive is not for individual gain. The motivation is for bringing people together to finding that sense of collective, to being up there on the stage and hearing tens of thousands of people sing together at once, and some sing high and some sing low, but it's the harmony. The voice that no one sings that comes out together. And we have to find our part, our song that we're going to sing, the poem we're going to tell, the story we're going to make according to our inclinations, our talent, what draws us forward. It may take some time to develop that, and it goes on changing. You know, some people have this notion I have to find my purpose. And then once I do, aha, you know. But purpose goes on like everything else evolving and it will evolve 
up until the day uh, we pass through this incarnation. So don't nail it down. Don't wait for a day. Aha, my purpose is and put it in a sentence or two. It's an evolutionary process. Uh, but find your board, get on the wave, ride it towards shore, and do the best we can. And that that is the purpose, but it's a common purpose. It's not for individual gain. It's not, you know, as Lynn Margulis, you mentioned her earlier, she said single-celled organisms took over the evolutionary process, not by competition, but by collaborating and networking. You know, the original cells didn't build a gated community to thrive, you know, so the neighbors couldn't get in. They said, how can we combine? How can we form multicellular organisms and work together? And we, as humanity, now need to come together in a super organism of the same extent. Drop our walls. Drop our silos. Find the community path of wholeness. And we'll be so pleased and so surprised in the process of how that enriches us individually and brings out the best in us. So by doing our work in service to the whole, we become ever more enriched individuals. It really does work. So trust the flow, trust the process, but feel the call, the call towards wholeness, and it will pull you. The whole traffic contractor will guide you. It really will. Our butt minister Fuller over well over 70 years ago, you know, asked uh, this question. He played the world game. He created the geodesic dome and the, the world's fair. They played that game and, and did many, many other things. He asked the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like? And the answer that he gave, his own answer, is also the why, kind of the why and the purpose for existing that you asked. But it's, he said, to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without the ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. And it's just unbelievable. One, 70 years ago, and that his why and purpose, it wasn't just for him to be a great architect and to be a billionaire or a millionaire or be successful. It was a why and purpose for the entire world. And he had a long life, and six successful life, and a ripple effect of this cooperation, collaboration, saying, let's do this together. Let's make something great of this, this uh, exactly what you said, Lynn Margulis. And I, I find that, you know, people start out, you, you, you talked about your professor, and you, and you said, he said to you, you found your life's work, you know, and that could be kind of your why or purpose, but what it evolved into it, and, and it has evolved and it's continued over time. You've changed, changed names and you've tried and iterated and, and you created the wave and, and everything. It's evolved. It's grown. It's, it, it's come into this wholeness and it's still going. There is no end point, so to say, of when this goal or this purpose or this life ends. It's one that lives beyond our physical bodies, our physical time on this earth. But it also envelops many people in the world. So the way you answered that, you know, I'm, I won't even ask you that question because you already answered it in the question of your why and purpose. And, and that's what um, my why and purpose is also uh, like that. Um, people ask, how do you keep going? How do you do this? How do you travel so, so much and speak to so many groups and to, to do the podcasts and the books and things. Uh, it's because it's not about me. It's about this movement. It's about this journey, and it gives me energy. And it's that principle we, we, we discussed, you know, in all living things and systems, it's one plus one is not two. It's a super exponential, and it's abundant. It's full of growth and full of life. And, and yes, there's, there's shit and there's death, in that, but that gets composted into good, healthy topsoil and manure and more life and more growth and more expansion. And so it gives energy and that. Uh, and um, I'm really thankful for your answer. And I'm so excited to to be able to see you in Ibiza and, and talk to you more and to, to conduct a workshop with you. 
I um, know that uh, you know we're we're getting ready to go to to Vita for the 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 wave coming up and and the the, the experience that we're going to have there and bring everybody together. But you already know about the next wave for next year, and I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that. And maybe if you could also tickle and tell us about anything else that's coming up on the horizon that we should keep our eyes open to and and how and where we should go to to look to get involved to be uh, at, at the next wave or to support, even if we can't make it to the wave, uh, uh, things that, that we can collaborate and come together as humanity um, with some of the great things we've talked about here today. Well, the wave will keep flowing on, that's for sure, once it's in motion. And as you mentioned, uh, what drives you is the way it creates its own. It builds from within, and it carries on. And uh, the longer we ride the wave, uh, the more we feel it, and the more naturally we we navigate it. So the way will flow forward. Uh, we are looking and really uh, working hard for developing waves and developing ways to bring the people on board uh, with the Holo Moment. Uh, so people can go to holomoment.net. Uh, we were working with Hilo, and we are creating what uh, we call holons. Holon is simultaneously a part and the whole. So creating two for small groups to self-organize with a purpose, a project, as a whole movement whole lot and uh, you can join through holomovement.net in the high low community register as a whole on and begin to interact with other whole ons and share ideas and resources uh, there and now we are trying to develop uh, onboarding and services and programs for the whole ons that will develop to offer them to help them boost them on their way or their journey. So we're looking for partnerships and programs and projects to include in the whole movement way to offer to the growing number of whole lives. So that'll be a big part of the, the whole movement wave and the visas to explore that develop. Um, going forward, uh, a lot of opportunities. Uh, Looks like uh, we'll have some presence in New York in September uh, around Peace Day, collaborating with some fellow Holonic organizations on that. And uh, we've sponsored numerous programs uh, over this year, Yoga Festival. We participated in Bioneers. We were the main sponsor of the Illuminate Film Festival. And we'll be doing more of that uh, in the year ahead. Uh, bringing the whole movement wave uh, to as many communities as we possibly can. And then uh, next year, the the annual conference of the whole movement wave uh, will continue. Uh, we'll be on the eastern United, central eastern coast of the United States area. Um, and we'll, we'll be announcing that conference uh, this next week at Ibiza. And our whole movement wave will, will take place next year, the last couple of days in May, the 1st and 2nd of June. So that that time period, uh, put it on your list. Uh, stay tuned to the whole movement wave, and we'll be announcing very soon the exact dates, location, and intentions of the forward flow wave. So uh, look forward to Seeing you and all of us reconvening uh, next year, we'll be back in the U.S. and uh, representing a new part of the demography of the United States. So it'll keep flowing, and there's many manifestations of the whole movement wave rippling out in resonance, in flow as we go, and uh, we'll be working on it. So. Stay tuned. That's that's absolutely fabulous, and I'm glad we mentioned that. We'll put a list of all the um, websites and the links where people can get in touch. So, um, Urban Lazo, Lynn Twist, Ken Wilbur, and many many other greats are in the book, um, the Holo Movement, and it is definitely something that 
we've only tickled upon now, but people should read if they know about some of the other people we've mentioned in this discussion. They'll be excited for the type of wisdoms and thoughts and the, and, and the direction those people are going on in their life work and how, how they move that. It's um, really, really good and interesting to get on board. How do we get on uh, up to speed and understand what's going on? Because for a lot of people on our planet, they're numb. They're they're desensitized. They haven't heard some of the things that we've talked about when I talk about systems thinking or uh, system science or quantum or resonance or frequency. People look at me like uh, I'm absolutely crazy. I've got a couple of screws loose or it should be mentalized. Um, and that can happen. That's some of the older systems and, and some of the things we've done in until it's talked about in a way as we've talked about it and, and it's shown in a way in the real life examples how we're dealing with this every single day in many ways that's not woo woo at all that's that's just real life and how the universe functions and works um that that we both don't understand but that that we just know and intrinsically internally feel that and and know that it's correct and right and that we're on the right path and that's also what gives us that energy. I want to thank uh, Tammy Michelle Scarlett from Unify for introducing you and I to each other. And I know that uh, Unify is a partner of yours and many other greats are partners. And uh, I also hope the Aloha Regenerative Foundation and Resonance Project on Earth and any of those that I'm involved with will, will support and, and be partners to carry on the wave and to be our own little part amongst the wave um, to help as well um, to be on this journey, uh, this beautiful journey together. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for letting us inside of all of your wonderful ideas, for bringing this to the world and not giving up and going through your life's work and your journey to give us this and the wisdoms that you have. Everybody, please read this book. Check it out. It's on Audible. It's on uh, audiobook. It's a physical book. And watch the podcast. Uh, get this knowledge. You'll be impressed. You'll be enlightened. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And I hope to see you very soon. And Abizo, we'll have a great time. We're going to do a workshop together, I think. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you next week, Mark. And uh, thank you. And for the great opportunity today, the wonderful thing for your heart and spirit and courage for doing what you're doing. And, you know, that's what we need to do. Be an example for everyone to ride the wave together and uh, find out that, yeah, it can be a little tricky, a little dangerous kind of ballads on your board, but it can be a great joy, too. And it can bring joy to our hearts that we finally found our purpose and that we're exhilarated and riding through the wind and the waves but in resonance to the whole. So it could be a lot of fun to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. It's great. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Many blessings. Thank you.